Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the research presentation with Fat Profits for this Wednesday, the 15th of October. My name is Kai Lewis. I'm one of the equities analysts on the floor, and joining us today will be Greg Smith, the head of research. Now, guys, apologies for taking a couple minutes to, uh, to kick off here. It's uh, a few technical issues, probably to do with the absolute monsoon that has, uh, has hit Sydney overnight, so uh, anybody in Sydney would know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, guys, we'll kick things off. So first things first, uh, as usual, this is an interactive session, so you can ask questions throughout the presentation. Just hit that little orange arrow up the top of your screen and then you can type your messages in there. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can towards the end of the presentation. Now, as always, this presentation is intended to be general in nature, so we don't take your personal situation into account and past performance is no indicator of future performance. So we'll get things underway. Now, uh, first things first, uh, Greg, can you hear me? Yeah, good morning, Kai. Good morning, everyone. Okay, so uh, a lot of volatility in the markets recently. So uh, can you talk, talk about what's been driving this and how are we positioning members? Yeah, certainly, Kai, and uh, good morning, everyone, again. I mean, of course, we have seen uh, an uptick in, in volatility, and, and one way of measuring this is the VIX index, which uh, the chart you will see in front of you has spiked, uh, certainly in, in the past few weeks. There's been a few drivers of this. I mean, initially, I suppose it was concern about the Fed raising rates, uh, uh, removing stimulus and uh, really sort of ending that, that money printing party that uh, we've seen. I suppose it's dissipated a little bit, uh, particularly of late, in that the, you know, the Fed has actually suggested that uh, they are more than aware of the headwinds that the global economy is facing, uh, particularly with respect to Europe, and they are conscious of that. They're also conscious of the strength that's been seen in the US dollar as well. So I think in terms of the rhetoric, that would suggest that uh, the, the timeline for those rate increases has been pushed out. Certainly not before Christmas, perhaps uh, middle of next year. And there's even been some suggestions from some members over the weekend that we could be even looking much later than that. So that uh, should help appease markets. Um, just as you're looking at the slide here, that's a longer term chart of the VIX, which shows that uh, even though volatility has spiked up quite a bit recently in context, uh, it's still nowhere near the levels we saw uh, prior to and during the GFC, as shown by the big spike towards the uh, left middle of that chart. Also, in terms of drivers of uh, volatility and angst, lately we have had uh, Ebola, and that's hit, of course, the, uh, the airline sector in particular. Uh, again, that's something that, that looks like it will be managed out with, uh, with all hands on deck. But I suppose the, the real big driver of angst, and this is particularly over the past uh, week or so, has been Europe uh, and in particular Germany. So the, the, the concerns about Europe have, have been well known uh, over the past few years since the GFC. Obviously the efforts to drive recovery there. And what really has kept uh, Europe going has been Germany, which has been, uh, I suppose, the engine room, if you like, of the of the continent. And the, the worrying thing uh, with respect to Germany is that uh, the, the data coming out it has been more on the negative side, and almost suggesting that the country is going to recession. We also had a more negative data out, out last night in terms of the growth for this and next year. So really in terms of the answer to that, that, that issue, um, it's really going to lay with the ECB and whether they really get their act together and push the button on full-scale quantitative easing, which they've really been reluctant to do. And ironically enough, they've been held back by the Germans. So I suppose the wonder will be now whether the Germans, having seen the issues in their own economy, uh, will actually free the ECB to, to do that. And if that does happen, that should really uh, reinvigorate confidence uh, with respect to Europe. Just looking at the chart that we have there, we're looking at the S&P, which we can see has been the last couple of years in a clear uptrend as signaled by the blue lines, but it has uh, broken down the bottom of the uh, the bottom of that channel lately, and this is on the back of those concerns I've mentioned. I think the, the trend line overall has to be respected, but then again, we have seen a break below that. So there is some possibility of further weakness in, the, in those US markets in the weeks ahead. But again, if we do see the Fed come out and clarify its position with respect to raising interest rates, they, that may well help on the upside. The other thing we're pointing out with respect to the US markets is that, that we are getting into the earnings season. Uh, that's underway. We've had uh, a few hits and a couple of misses, and a positive earnings season would, uh, would, would do well as, in terms of equities. 
point we're also making about those US markets though is they are expensive in terms of relative value versus some other markets. You're looking at 16, 17 times the S&P. Uh, you compare that to say uh, China for instance, which uh, the, the Shanghai Composite is on half that multiple. So in terms of positioning uh, our portfolios, you know, we are looking at selectively Taking, taking profits on strong performers, uh, cutting non-performers, but also looking at the, the allocation of our portfolios. And I mentioned the US relative valuation, I mentioned China. So that latter country is one that we are targeting. Um, has double, half the valuation, but double the growth rate. Uh, so that's one way that, that members can assist themselves during this current vol volatility. Greg, if we just turn to the uh, the, the Eurozone, and you mentioned it, uh, Germany having a bit of a breakdown as well. Can you elaborate on how that affects the, uh, well, firstly, the DAX and also the Euro as a currency? Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, the, the, the German DAX, which is the, the market we're looking at here, has been uh, has been pretty strong uh, for, for much of the period since, since the GFC and obviously has weakened uh, lately on the back of this economic data that we're getting out of Germany, it's broken below that blue line. That's a little bit of concern uh, and, and as I mentioned, what's really going to get that going and reinstall confidence in the German economy and also Europe at large with German being, Germany being a key growth driver will be the ECB getting the act together. They've talked about doing whatever is needed and so they really need to sort of follow through on their actions, speak louder than words as it were. Uh, and this is also going to be reflected in the performance of the Euro. Uh, see, we are looking at very much a race to the bottom uh, in terms of many currencies globally, and the, the euro has been no different. The decline in the euro that we've seen since the GFC has really suited Germany as an export powerhouse um, in terms of its export export prowess. And um, obviously, we've seen the, the euro dip below that blue dotted line, but it has perked up a little bit recently, and that has been, I suppose, in line with disappointment over the ECB not doing more. So I think if we see further weakness in the euro, that is going to give further kickstart uh, to European equities and Germany in particular. And if we turn to the Australian market as well, how does this all play out uh, closer to home? Yeah, so obviously Australia has not been immune to uh, to to the, the situation we're seeing globally, obviously is closely correlated and looks to looks for a lead for the overnight action from the US, uh, in particular in, in Europe to some degree as well. I suppose the interesting thing uh, with the Australian market is that we, the recent uh, we we have of course seen volatility in the resource sector, which is key to us. But a lot of the uh, I guess the fortunes of the resource sector are closely tied to that of China. I think we're seeing some really encouraging signs lately. Whilst we've seen negative data out on Germany, we've seen some pockets of encouragement in terms of China, in terms of the, a soft landing being achieved there. We've seen them cut interest rates uh, in terms of the repo rate yesterday for the second time in a month. So the Chinese government uh, and the Chinese central bank are really getting behind the economy to ensure that it's a, a soft rather than a hard landing. You're seeing this in the Shanghai Composite. And in terms of relating this back to the Australian market, it's going to be naturally good for the uh, for the resource sector if China sees that soft landing. Uh, if you play it uh, forward and look at commodity prices, key prices such as iron ore, for instance, which uh, had been, has been going backwards at a rate of knots, and uh, it was only a few weeks ago that um, the doomsayers were talking about the end of the Iron Age. Now, interestingly, in the last few days, you've seen uh, strength in that iron ore price. In fact, Monday was the biggest one-day one day jump for many years. Uh, that's led to a rally in the iron ore miners, including the likes of Rio and BHP. So the turnaround in China and the stability there may we may actually be reaching the tipping point, and rather than uh, seeing these commodity prices going to free fall, we actually may be seeing something of a U-turn. Uh, we've also seen that in the likes of copper, with prices there ticking up over the last couple of days. And this is good news for the big diversified miners, but also filters down through the rest of the resource sector and also Australia's uh, economy at large. Obviously, in terms of the Australian market, the other key thing is what the Australian dollar has been doing, and there's been obviously being a lot of jawboning by the RBA to try and get the currency down. And we've started to see this uh, depreciate quite quite markedly in the last few weeks. And this is positive for not only uh, our exporters, but also our domestic economy as well, many aspects of it, which I talked about uh, last week, for instance, inbound tourism being one of those. 
but particularly on the export side. So we've seen the Aussie hit the 87, 88 cents uh, versus the US dollar. But uh, we think the RBA might not be done yet is trying to engineer further weakness. And, and indeed, it was interesting to see the assistant governor yesterday talk about the currency still being too high and still only being whipped back to where it was um, last year. So watch the space in terms of further weakness in the Australian dollar and that filtering through uh, to the Aussie market. Just looking at it from a technical perspective, that's been pretty important that that 5100 level uh, holds and it has done. Uh, this week, and uh, I guess a lot of that in terms of strength going forward will uh, rest a lot with the resource sector. Okay, and if we turn to the uh, the income portfolio as well, there, Greg. So, I mean, we've been pushing that uh, it is a yield game out there and has been for quite some time. So, we've updated the income report recently. Were there any surprises there? Not too much. I suppose you yeah, the, the the key thing that's highlighted since our last review is the benefit. Uh, of yield and the downside protection that it provides. And this is despite the fact that uh, a number of the stocks in the portfolio are in the banking sector, which have also been under pressure as well. But if you look at the total capital return that we've generated you know, at the bottom is 24.3%. So that's quite a big gap. This is just capital return versus the ASX 200, which has generated 18.7% over the same time frame. So the portfolio, just as a reminder, was established in March 2012, and we're accumulating the return since that period. Uh, the income portfolio has also done its job in terms of delivering yield, and uh, over that period has generated around about 10.6% in income. So what we're really looking for here is a, a basket of stable, well-run companies uh, with st stability not only in earnings but also in the yields that they're putting out. So we've, put, we've made a couple of changes to the portfolio just really from a uh, improving the risk reward balance for this lower risk portfolio. Uh, the mining services sector has been under significant pressure, as we know, uh, program maintenance has quite a number of differentiators from uh, other companies within the space, but uh, hasn't really been able to uh, fend off the headwinds in terms of sentiment. So, despite the good yield there, despite the fact that we think that it will be maintained, uh, we have removed that one from the portfolio. And in its place, we've replaced it with uh, S Centre Group, which is a spin out of uh, Westfield. And we think the company is very well run, uh, has one of the better. Uh, shopping portfolios in Australia, and uh, obviously good a good yield as well. So we've kept the composition relatively the same, but yeah, I think the key thing that the uh, the income portfolio has highlighted are the defensive characteristics of yield. And certainly that theme remains intact, doesn't it, Greg? I mean, we're still looking, as you mentioned, for those stable companies, stable earnings, uh, business models that are sustainable into the future and, and usually ob obviously not immune to weakness in, in the market, but they do tend to fare better overall, don't they? That's right. That's absolutely correct. So we'll take a look at a couple of the stocks in the portfolio or the report from last night. And the first one is Bentham IMF. Now, uh, the share price has been quite volatile recently. What's the attraction that we still have with this stock, Greg? Yeah, I mean, the number of attractions really there, Kai. I mean, it has been volatile. It is quite a high beta stock, and why it has, uh, it's, it's actually a good dovetail with the income portfolio because whilst it has a, a good yield, it is quite volatile, so it probably doesn't quite make the grade in terms of making it into that portfolio. Um, look, it does have many of the other uh, attributes that we are looking for. It's a strong management team. Uh, in terms of litigation cases, they've had a good deal flow. Recently, they've got a diversified investment portfolio, so that really goes towards their positive thesis. Uh, and they've also partnered up with um, Elliott Management, which uh, really strengthens, strengthens the case as well. And this is going to assist them in funding cases through Europe and also co-fund larger cases uh, in Asia. And that's really giving uh, IMF or Bentham IMF a, a partner with really deep pockets and this could open up a number of attractive opportunities for the for the company going forward. And really I suppose the, 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 the top down thesis on this is that we're looking for IMF to become potentially a leading litigation player globally. And uh, look, earnings can be uh, somewhat volatile and difficult to predict. As the slide shows, the, uh, the company does have a tr tremendous track record in terms of its uh, cases completed, which is really going to help earnings and also in turn uh, delivering a yield on the back of that. Uh, based on consensus estimates, we're looking at just under nine times 2015 earnings, which is uh, inexpensive as far as we're concerned. It also comes with a, a strong yield as well. So 
has been volatile, but we, we certainly think this is uh, a, a good holding over the medium to longer term. So still a buy there, guys. Uh, current report is in that members area uh, in the Australasian Equities report, uh, and it's still a good yield and, and growth moving forward on that one, in our opinion. So the next stock that we'll take a look at, a number of questions coming through on the banks, so very timely, uh, ANZ. So look, we've uh, the banks have been weak. We've put a sell half on ANZ. Do you still like the sector overall, though, Greg? Yeah, we still do. I think obviously the banks have been under pressure uh, for on a number of areas. We um, see so with, with, with respect to ANZ, it's a stock that we have done well on. Uh, talked about before about how we're reacting to volatility in terms of taking profits, and really what we're doing here is we're taking some profits off ANZ, which has been a strong performing share for us. But we still think it's a, a substantial mirror over the medium to longer term. If we look at the concerns that have been driving weakness uh, in the banking sector, I suppose we're talking about worries over mortgage lending growth, the Murray Inquiry and a rotation out of yield. And if we look at the profit side of things, I suppose it's fair to say the banks have enjoyed a, uh, the glory years, I suppose, or a purple patch whilst the uh, housing market has been strong, interest rates have been low and mortgage lending has been very very robust. So I suppose there's some concerns there that uh, that party is about, about to end. And I think whilst we are seeing some s slowing perhaps in the housing market overall, I think the low interest from rate environment that is going to likely to remain in place, and I mentioned the RBA earlier, is going to continue to provide support for earnings in that regard. In terms of the Murray inquiry, the results or the outcome of that is uh, due to be uh, release next month, and there's something been selling on the back of that as well. Again, whilst we, we may see some moves with respect to increases in capital and perhaps a modest increase in common equity tier one capital, don't think that the outcome is going to be as punitive as the markets have feared, particularly from a you look at it on a global peer basis. Australian banks are reasonably well capitalised. I uh, talked about the rotation out of yield. Again, I think that argument is, is probably going to abate somewhat as well. Interest rates are set to re remain low in Australia, but also I think, as I mentioned about before, in terms of money heading out of Australia over to the US, the interest rate uh, timeline for increases there is probably going to be extended more than anything. With respect to ANZ, in terms of a medium to long term view, we still like the, the, the company's strategy. They're targeting becoming a regional Asian bank, which uh, makes sense and makes sense to us, particularly given our, our bullish view on the re region. They've been performing well. Uh, their recent uh, results for the nine months through the 30th of June showed 8% year on year growth in earnings. That uh, shows that that side of the, the equation is going well. And their core equity uh, T1 capital ratio has been increasing as well, which is also a good sign. So from a medium to long term point of view, still like the stock, you're looking at a yield of uh, five, five and three quarter percent and around about 12 times earnings. Okay, so we still like the other uh, company overall, guys, but do recommend that you uh, consider taking up uh, some profits off the top there. So the next stock we'll take a look at uh, is Spark New Zealand. So we've done very well on our high-yielding telco stocks over the years, particularly in the Australian market. How much more does Spark have left in it, Greg? I think it certainly has uh, more in it there, Kai. And uh, yeah, as you, as you point out, we have done well over the years. I suppose getting into Telstra early, we're obviously we're in BT Group as well uh, in the UK. And Spark is um, somewhat newer to the portfolio in that regard, but we're still looking at a pretty healthy gain considering the, the short space of time that we've been in it. And just to sort of recap, this is a uh, this is a former state-owned telco which is uh, undergoing a similar transfer transformation to other telcos around the world trying to, to deal with the, the challenges of the new wave technologies in the 21st century in general and making up for attrition and fixed line uh, revenues. And I th don't think the penny has quite dropped yet, but this is what Spark is embarking on, despite the fact there's been a, a, a pretty uh, obvious rebranding from Telecom New Zealand to Spark. We, it's, it's following a very similar path in many ways to the likes of uh, Telstra and also BT or British Telecom in the UK. Uh, it's been making, it's been cut, cutting costs to shore up earnings, but yeah, the real story is, I suppose, at the top line, the growth that we're seeing. It's taking on Vodafone, which has been the dominant mobile player, and it's uh, it's winning there. It's growing market share. 
It's uh, added con uh, it's grown connections to above 2 million. It's also positioned itself really well with respect to 4G spectrum, so it's set to take even more market share off its competitors in our view. It's been holding the line in broadband, and it's also looking to shore up its position there as well uh, through taking advantage of new opportunities. So it's just launched uh, internet TV, and that's something we're also seeing in Australia uh, and indeed globally with a convergence of operators there, and that's going to kick in some nice growth opportunities as well. It hasn't been... Uh, uh, immune from selling, and this is again on the back, I suppose, of a bit of a rotation away from yielding stocks. But again, just as I talked about with the uh, the banks in Australia, I think the yield appeal of Spark is going to kick back into place. We're looking at a yield of around about 6%. Uh, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand has also uh, been somewhat surprising, and it's holding back on aggressive interest rate rises. So that's going to remain interest rates remain relatively lower to, to where I suppose investors had expected them to be in terms of the, the New Zealand environment, and that's going to kick in as well. But overall, I think the turnaround story here, which has been kicked off with the rebranding recently, has much further to run. All right, so that full report there, guys, is in the uh, members area. Spark New Zealand, uh, great yield, as Greg mentioned. So, uh, you know, a, a good stock to be taking a look at if you haven't already. Now, the last one there, we'll take a look at the uh, the UK portfolio. So we've got quite a few pub companies in the UK portfolio, and uh, we recommended Marston's last week. So can you tell us a bit about the thinking behind this one, Greg? Yeah, it's interesting going back to the original thinking when we uh, added these pub companies is that British beer drinking has been going uh, going down steadily. Pubs have been closing at record rates, um, which may seem a bit of a contrarian idea to put buyers on a whole lot of pub companies. But the reality was, and what we felt, and indeed what is actually happening now, is that the well-branded operators were actually going to benefit from the uh, consolidation occurring in the sector. And that's certainly what's happened. And Marston's is one of the, the better branded operators in the UK market. So it's benefiting from that. It's also benefiting from the fact that the UK uh, recovery has been gaining traction in recent years. There's been a little bit of a wobble recently, I suppose, and concerns over Europe. But all things said, uh, the UK economy is growing pretty quickly in terms of developed world. And that's filtering through to the consumer and filtering through to discretionary spending as well. And uh, likes of Marston's and other stocks that we have in the portfolio in the sector are also benefiting from a greater emphasis on food, for example, and dining out, which the pub companies are, uh, are sort of taking advantage of. Uh, we were encouraged by the recent results there, and you look at the valuation, it's uh, not stretched by any means. It's trading on around about 10 times earnings, and you're also getting a decent yield here of around about 5% as well. Okay, so guys, that uh, report is available in the UK report for those people that do have access. Uh, if you don't have access to the UK reports, just give us a call. Uh, you can call us on 1300 881177. Happy to have a chat to you about those. Uh, now move on to some questions here, Greg, and we've got a number coming through, so keep them coming through, guys. The first one is from Reg, and Reg is saying, uh, do we stick to our prediction uh, of 5,800 points on the All Lords by the year end? Uh, thanks for that question, Reg. Uh, obviously, we, we made our outlook statements at the start of the year, and look, we're, we're currently set at 5,200. Uh, 5,800 is, is potentially going to be a bit of a stretch. Uh, we're looking at, obviously, 11 to 12% uh, rally over that time. I suppose one thing we have said in terms of uh, what we're seeing at the moment, I covered volatility at the start of the presentation, is that October is typically a month when uh, when markets don't perform too well, and indeed they often bottom, and it has shown to be the case historically. I think the key driver for the ASX and what's going to get us anywhere near to that level is going to be performance from the resource sector, and I mentioned uh, earlier about what we're seeing in iron ore and copper potentially bottoming, the positivity we're seeing out of China. I think if that um, that gains momentum, that's going to give a real kick to our market in November and December once we get through the seasonally weak month. The other thing that potentially is going to aid in that endeavour as well is the banks. And if we do get that Murray inquiry coming out and the capital requirements aren't as uh, punitive as fair, that's also going to be a decent lift. And I think the final thing as well is that return to yield and that realisation that, okay, interest rates in, America, in the US may be going up uh, sooner than Australia, but again, it's not going to be for some time. So, look, I, I think it is quite possible that we will see a, a decent rally into November, December, and if we do that, yeah, we could well be near, uh, certainly within Kui of those sort of levels. Okay, and a question here from Peter, and Peter is asking about uh, BWP Trust uh, and saying that it does appear to be a bit out of whack with the, uh, the sector generally. Do we have any updates on BWP there, Greg? 
Uh, it, it does, Sidney, but we still like uh, BW, BWP. Uh, we think it's a, a very well company. I think, as I mentioned in last week's uh, presentation, we like the positioning and we like the relationship that we've got with uh, that sort of that they've got with Bunnings as well in terms of underpinning earnings. So yeah, we do like the company still. It actually is in the uh, income portfolio as well. So that sort of gives a big sign about what we think uh, about the future earnings and dividend outlook. So. Yeah, it's certainly remain positive on that company. And we've got a question here from Stephen, and Stephen is, is asking, well, we, we put a sell half on ANZ, so what do we feel about uh, Westpac, CBA, uh, NAB as well? So we don't cover NAB at the moment, Stephen, but it, it really does fall uh, in, into the same sector, obviously. Uh, what are our thoughts on the other banks at the moment, Greg? Yeah, we are looking at the other banks. Obviously, that, yeah, we, I suppose our view on the sector in general is pretty clear that we are positive over the medium to longer term, but we're not going to be adverse to taking selective profits if we think uh, it warrants it. We have seen significant outperformance in our holding on ANZ, which was which was part of the decision there, uh, and we will be looking to cover Westpac within the within the coming weeks. Uh, and I think we will probably look at our rating at that stage. Okay, and we have a question here from Tessa, and Tessa is asking for an update. What are our thoughts on Titan Energy? Uh, it's obviously very unfortunate what's happened with Titan. It has had a uh, you know a really steady decline uh, in the last couple of weeks. What are our thoughts on this one, Greg, and moving forward with it? Yeah, uh, thanks for your question, Tessa. Obviously, uh, uh, Titan Energy was, was one in terms of, uh, I suppose, highlights the, uh, the fact that no one has perfect information. And as I mentioned last week in the presentation, the, yeah, the disturbing thing was that the downgrade that we saw came only a few weeks after the company reaffirmed guidance. And obviously that has come on the back of uh, losing a couple of important contracts. I think there's obviously a lot of emotion swinging around the stock at the moment. I think it is important when emotion is swirling to really step back and look at the fundamentals and look at the realities. And the reality is if the, the company can hold on to the current contracts that it does, which looks likely, then you, you're looking at trading on around about two times EBIT. Um, now that is a fairly depressed valuation to say, to say the least. And if the company, I think near term things are going to remain challenged, but should they be able to hold on to those contracts, which looks likely, and more importantly, if they're able to be reasonably quick in replacing the contracts that they have lost, I think you, you, you can see a recovery. Obviously it is very volatile at the moment. It is a um, a stock that the market has lost uh, trust with uh, somewhat, so it's going to need to take a bit for that trust to be restored. But looking at it coldly, uh, this is, I suppose the other thing worth pointing out about Titan as well in terms of the financial stability of the company, the gearing rate, it's, it's not over endowed with, with, with debt, so we are looking at a reasonable gearing rate which gives it a good chance of buffeting these headwinds operationally over the coming over the coming months. So that's important. Uh, but I think if they can replace these contracts and, and provide some positive news flow in the next few months, that'll be the key to restoring market faith and also restoring shareholder value. Okay, and we've got another question here. Guys, we actually got, have some, a few similar questions, so I might just run a poll quickly. So you can click on that throughout the presentation as we answer some of these questions. Just let us know what, uh, what you're looking for, what you're interested in the most. Uh, another question here from Pommy about uh, the index. Will it go under 5,000 and when might this happen? Um, certainly, Greg did mention the uh, significance of the 5,100 level, uh, but do you have any further comments here, Greg? Yeah, I think it's important. Technically, uh, 5100 needs to hold, uh, and it has held at this stage, and the market's indeed bounced off that. And I'll just probably just go back to my earlier earlier point about in terms of what's going to drive or, pr or, or prop up the index, and it is going to be that resource sector, which is going to be very important. So I think in terms of going below 5100, uh, I think the fundamental drivers, if we see our performance in the resource index and str strong data continue to come out of China, support from the Chinese government and the People's Bank uh, and that flying through to iron ore, copper prices and the like, yeah, we should we should see the resource sector continue to push the, uh, the market back up. And a question here from Yul about QBE and obviously uh, a few skeletons in the closet that uh, have come out in the wash recently uh, with QBE, a couple of write downs and, uh, and a pretty close look at their overseas uh, revenue streams. Uh, Yule's asking about whether we think QBE will likely remain depressed, whether it will disappoint us again uh, in the short term. Okay, I guess this is obviously another company as well that we talk about sort of losing trust with the market and, uh, and, and QBE uh, hasn't been great at winning trust in the last uh, year or so. And 
I think that there was an important corner turn potentially with them being very, very open about their exposures in Latin America. And I think, ironically enough, that, that's a, a part of the trust building exercise. I think the other thing I've seen that's happened as well is that they are looking at the businesses in terms of selling non core assets and boosting capital and hiving off businesses. So you're also looking at, I suppose, them winning back confidence in terms of the company's capital position. And that has been they've been fully transparent, I think, with respect to that as well. So yeah, we do think that uh, QBE can perform over the medium to longer term. And as I've said in previous weeks as well, uh, probably not a, a story for this year. Going forward, if we do see interest rates or the yield curve tick back up, they're going to be a, in a good position. They've got one of the lowest uh, duration portfolios around. It's around about 0.5. So they can rotate the whole investment portfolio in less than six months. And that's going to sort of free them from the, I suppose they've been weighed down by, by the, the, the investment income declines. And that's going to really provide a kick to earnings. But I think the key thing to restoring faith is obviously no more, no more negative surprises. Uh, and uh, obviously that balance sheet exercise has also been a, a, a big positive. So a bit of a, a bit of work to do short term rebuilding that trust there, you'll but, uh, but certainly we still like QBE for the long term. Uh, guys, time for one last question there. I'll just close that poll off. So uh, if you'd like to click on that, just do so now. Uh, we've got a question from Julie, and Julie's asking what are our thoughts on oil search? Uh, obviously, been a, a bit of a weak period with uh, with oil coming off uh, fairly substantially as well recently. Greg, what do we think of oil search? Yeah, well, that, that, that's right. I, I suppose you know, addressing oil search, just we're probably addressing the sector in general, and um, we, we have seen, I suppose, some key commodity prices, as I mentioned, perk back up. I mentioned iron ore, and I mentioned copper, but oil, but oil has been consistently weak uh, in 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 the, in the past week, and has broken some key levels as well. I think a large part of that, when it comes down to it, I suppose we have the shale gas uh, phenomenon. We have new supply coming on. But I think probably the, the straw that's broken oils back recently has been suggestions that the cartels, and in particular OPEC, are uh, a little bit more relaxed about where the uh, where the oil price is in terms of defending a range. I'm not so sure that that, uh, that they're going to let the oil price continue to slide because at the end of the day, it, 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 is, will, it will be hurting their coffers. Uh, Saudi Arabia has been pretty vocal in the past and has softened a little bit in terms of the oil price that is um, comfortable with. I think a lot of this has been speculation and uh, again, I suppose uh, actions speak louder than words. So I think if we step in and see likes of OPEC or, or Saudi Arabia come out and look to defend uh, that oil price, which they've been pretty comfortable with, and particularly being sort of north of $80 a barrel, then that will provide uh, some support to the sector. And that's, uh, and that's on the supply side. In terms of the, the demand side, China is a big consumer, as is Asia. Uh, that is going to help stabilise the oil price, and uh, as will uh, renewed confidence in Europe. Meanwhile, obviously, we've got the US economy stepping back up through the gears as well. So I think the near term, yeah, there may well be further volatility in the oil price. I think if we get some signals from uh, those cartels, that will certainly help. But long term, I think the demand side for a uh, the bull market resuming in energy prices remains. And with that view, we remain positive on oil search. So that full report is available in the members area as well, guys. Our latest thoughts on oil search. Uh, and Greg mentioned, obviously, uh, you know, energy is, is still a priority for us, priority on most governments' to-do lists around the world as well. So we're certainly still bullish on the sector. Guys, we might wrap things up here. We are running out of time. But thank you for joining us this morning, Greg. Thanks, Paul, and thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Okay, guys, so any questions we didn't get to, if you'd like more information about the session this morning, give us a call, 1300 881177. My name is Kai Lewis. I'm one of the equities analysts here, so feel free to ask for me or shoot through your inquiries, invest at fatprofits.com.au. So thank you for joining us today, guys. Uh, happy investing today and enjoy your morning.